Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Yellowstone National Park. No, we aren't going to the broad expanses of the Lamar Valley or some backcountry trail too close to a bison carcass. The attack we will be discussing happened at one of the most visited locations in the entire park, Old Faithful Geyser. Yes, the crowds of people that visit the geyser in the peak month of July approach one million in number. That comes out to about 30,000 people daily and about 1,000 people each hour. The elevation here is a little over 7,300 feet high, and the rolling granite hills are sparsely covered with pine, fir, and spruce trees. Elk, moose, deer, bison, and antelope are visible from nearly any road in the park, but sometimes cause traffic jams here. The raised boardwalks meander a safe distance away from deceptively tranquil pools of boiling mineralized water. Black bears, cougars, coyotes, and wolves roam this area, but the danger they pose pales in comparison to those grizzly bears present. On Saturday, June 24, 1972, 25-year-old Harry Walker was hitchhiking around the country in a reevaluation of his life. He was traveling with his friend, 29-year-old Philip Bradbury from Oxford, Alabama, who went by the nickname Crow. Harry hailed from Anniston, Alabama, and was a farmer. The men had left 19 days prior and wound up in Yellowstone during its centennial celebration. Upon entering the park, the men were allowed admittance for free because they were on foot and not in a vehicle. The rangers didn't do this for everyone, but allowed Harry and Philip in as a favor. While making their way through the various gates and offices, the men had somehow managed to miss all the literature provided regarding the danger of bears in the park. For the past few decades, there had been a debate brewing among biologists and other scientists about just how the park should be run. In 1943, Olaus Murray had called on authorities to close down dumps that park employees used to dispose of their trash. Bears were known to gather around the dump sites, and at one point, seven grizzlies had been observed at a single dump. Given the total population was below 100 bears at one point, that is a significant percentage of the bear population that were relying on dumps for food. For the eight decades prior, bears had been allowed to scavenge food from Yellowstone dumps, but conscientious scientists noted that they didn't need them, and it was unnatural. Given this permission and encouragement, bears that otherwise would avoid human contact were trained to tolerate and even seek it out for sustenance. Since the bears were hanging out along the roads, begging for food, many visitors safely ventured into the backcountry, which was nearly void of bears in comparison. By the late 60s, the discussion had reached fever pitch, and two camps had formed among the scientists. One camp believed in closing the dumps at once and forcing the bears to go back to natural food sources. The other camp was led by two biologists, the Craighead brothers. The Craigheads noticed that closing the dumps too quickly would force human-dependent bears to invade campgrounds in search of food. They proposed that road-killed carcasses of deer, elk, and bison be helicoptered into the backcountry to lure the bears away from the dumps. The dumps could then be closed slowly so that lingering bears would follow their noses to feed on carcasses and away from campgrounds. The Craighead brothers summarized their proposal in a 113-page report and delivered it to Yellowstone Superintendent John McLaughlin in 1967. In the same year, a spat of grizzly bear maulings and human fatalities occurred in Glacier National Park and became known as the Night of the Grizzlies. Two women were killed by bears habituated to eating from dumps near ranger stations. The potential of having a similar occurrence in Yellowstone prompted McLaughlin to order an immediate and sudden closure of all dumps in the park. Visitors to the park were not provided bear-proof dumpsters at this time, and weren't particularly afraid of having bears come into their camps. After all, only a few years prior, they were allowed to hand-feed bears along the roadsides. Their perception of bears was that they were harmless and wouldn't hurt you, even if they did eat all of your food. Grizzlies being grizzlies, the closure of the dumps caused an enormous uptick in bear attacks and hostility. The rangers were charged with protecting the public, so the problem bears were shot, reducing an already low population to near extinction. 
1970, 57 grizzlies were killed by people, and only five years later, just 136 grizzlies remained. This brings us back to Harry and Philip's visit to the park. The men had decided to camp at Old Faithful Geyser at an unauthorized campsite. Rangers knew that many visitors were illegally camping but overlooked it, neglecting to enforce the laws due to the experience people were having. They pitched their camp only a few hundred feet from the boardwalk behind a screen of lodgepole pines. They could easily walk to the creek for water from there and only had to worry about the rangers chasing them out. Just behind their campsite, a thick growth of smaller trees screened anything hiding within it from view. Since the park authorities failed to notify the public of the dumping ground closures, the men were unaware of the danger they were in. What Harry and Philip didn't know was that a sow that lived in the area had been known as a problem bear. The ranges had coordinated her relocation previously, but she'd always found her way back. She was a regular at the dump behind the Rabbit Creek Ranger Station, which was closed, and now she was looking for a new food source. The Craighead brothers had conducted a ten-year study on the grizzlies in Yellowstone Park, in which this sow was an unwilling participant. They had pioneered the use of radio collars for collecting data on bears and their travel patterns. She was caught and collared by the brothers and was labeled as Bear 1792. By the end of the Craighead study, all data and observations regarding the location and travel patterns of bears had ended at the same time the dump sites were closed. At the time of her capture and collaring, Bear 1792 was noted to be an older female with worn out and broken teeth. When she was relocated, she was moved to an area only 18 miles away and easily found her way back. Now Harry and Philip were enjoying their time in the park, and Philip had taken LSD that evening. They spent a good portion of the night wandering the geyser basin, chatting with people, and soaking in all that the park offered. By around 1 a.m., they were headed back to their clandestine campsite, using their flashlights to illuminate their way. The men were what rangers would call dirty campers. They left their food storage on the ground and didn't remove their food waste from their campsite. As they approached their tents, Harry paused and asked Philip if he'd heard something. The men craned their necks and heard chewing sounds coming from just a few yards away and near their tents. Harry lifted the beam from his flashlight in the direction of the noise, and it was immediately filled with the open jaws of a charging grizzly bear. The sow was upon the men before they could do anything but yell. Harry was knocked down with a swat of the bear's paws, and Philip turned to run. Within the first few steps of his retreat, Philip was sent tumbling down the hillside. He rolled and tumbled several yards, giving him separation from the bear's anger. The sow immediately turned back toward Harry and pounced on him in a frenzied attack. Philip could hear the bear growling and his friend howling in pain as he ran a short distance before turning around. He hadn't seen Harry, but was sure the bear had left. They had merely surprised her, after all, and he was hopeful that she'd fled after sending the men running. Philip turned his head toward their camp and yelled, Harry, did the bear leave yet? His question was met with Harry's plea, Help me, crow! Harry's cries for his friend brought the sow back to finish what she'd started. Philip turned and stumbled toward the old faithful inn about a quarter mile away. Philip followed the lights on the building to its front doors and stumbled inside, breathing heavily and exhausted by about 1.10 a.m. He stammered that his friend had been attacked by a bear and needed help. The rangers headed out to the campsite, but were uneasy about entering the timber in the dark of night. Calling out for Harry and hearing no reply, they returned, deciding to wait until morning. By sunrise, a handful of rangers had returned to the men's campsite and quickly found Harry's remains. The grizzly had partially consumed his body, so they gathered his corpse to deliver to the coroner. They next set out snares and used road-killed carcasses as bait. The sow returned to the place where she left Harry's corpse and was snared, allowing rangers to capture her. While restrained by the snare, she was shot and killed. The carcass of the 400-pound sow was taken to Montana State for analysis. The forensics team there found human hair on the sow's claws. Her stomach contained tinfoil and other camp debris that she'd consumed at the men's campsite. Following Harry's death, his family filed a lawsuit alleging negligence on the part of park management. They won their case in circuit court, but the Ninth Circuit overturned the circuit court's decision. The Supreme Court refused to take up the case, and Harry's family lost their farm seeking justice. 
Their efforts did lead to the park refining policies on how bears were managed. Although the dump site supported the bears, it caused a very negative change in their behavior. For several years after their closure, bears were observed digging in dump sites that had long since been covered over. The grizzlies clearly remembered their former source of food and would regularly visit in hopes of finding more, even decades later. Due to mismanagement, grizzly bear populations bottomed out in 1990 at only 99 bears. It has taken almost 30 years for populations to reach their current levels of an estimated 750 bears. A book by the name of Engineering Eden, written by Jordan Fisher Smith, discusses this attack and its ramifications on modern environmental policy. I've linked to it in the pinned comment below, so check it out. I've also provided a link to the information revealed in the lawsuit filed by Harry's family. It paints a clear picture of the park's negligence. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. Were park authorities negligent in their actions, or do park visitors assume the risk while in the park? Should people be involved in natural processes, or leave them alone? Should grizzly bear populations be managed through hunting or relocation? I'll be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.